further ado, a few uh, <coughs> introductory words on sepsis. So recognising it, sometimes it's blindingly obvious, isn't it? You know, we have the patient with the meningococcal rash or the lobar pneumonia or the mucky urine or the cloudy CSF. They're the easy ones. It doesn't take any brain to recognise these. Unfortunately, many of our patients, especially if they present early, non-specifically, they're the not-so-obvious cases. And uh, clearly, the different patients we have, you know, we're often torn between, well, are they septic or aren't they? This is a, a nice paper from Alan Jones and his group in the US, where they looked at patients coming through his emergency department, and more than 50% of the patients who were thought to have um, sepsis, actually had negative culture results, and of all the patients they looked at, about 20% eventually had a non-infectious diagnosis. And you can see here are uh, these non-infectious mimics, you know, inflammatory colitis, medication effects, pulmonary embolus, ketoacidosis, etc. So lots of other causes that are confused as having sepsis. And, you know, in my experience, you know, recently, in the last year or so, we've had these sorts of different types of presentation, which look, smell like sepsis, but actually turn out to be something else. So, clearly, we have a challenge with current diagnostics. Uh, this is a study I was involved with where it's looking at molecular diagnostics, and, you know, I think it is still challenging. We often get it wrong in both directions. We think a patient septic, treat them as septic, but they're not, or the other way around, we don't pick up the fact that they are actually septic. So here's a, a study where four times as much blood culture or blood samples, so we took cultures and molecular biolo biology techniques at the same time, and approximately four times as many pathogens were found on DNA testing as opposed to standard blood cultures. Now, the significance of these positive DNAs obviously needs further work, but I think we're probably missing a lot with conventional techniques. And the mortality for these culture-negative but DNA-positive ones was actually very high. And I think these sorts of technologies will be soon point of care. So I think our ease with actually diagnosing uh, the presence of a bug will be much, much more readily available. Defining it. So hopefully you've all read Sepsis 3. Shame on you if you haven't. And um, what we tried to do with that was um, to actually try and use data to actually underpin the recommendation. So, again, we mainly relied on US databases, Pan Hospital databases, and about 850,000 patients worth of data. So, in the good old days, we had infection and a bit of SIRS going to sepsis, a bit of organ dysfunction, severe sepsis, septic shock. If you weren't responding to fluid and you had cardiovascular collapse, the problem is SIRS is often a normal host response to just having a bad cold. But it doesn't mean you need admitting to an ICU. Cardiovascular collapse was ill-defined in the old definitions, as was organ dysfunction. So there was this big heterogeneity in terms of incidence, in terms of mortality of this condition. So we tried to simplify it. You have infection, bog-standard infection, but it's the bad infection where you get the dysregulated host response, which causes the organ dysfunction, which makes you septic. And the septic shock component is a group who are at much greater risk of dying than from sepsis alone. It's about a 50-60% increased risk of dying. So the new definition brings up to date our current thinking of pathophysiology, a dysregulated host response, a life-threatening organ dysfunction, and we're using a change in SOFA score of two or more in the presence of an infection to define or to operationalise this definition. Likewise for septic shock, the pathophysiology, it's more than just a low blood pressure. You need that combination of circulatory, cellular metabolic abnormalities, giving you a higher risk of dying. 
And again, looking at the data, that combination of a low blood pressure, not responding to fluid, and a lactate that remains high despite <coughs> adequate fluid resuscitation, that gives you septic shock. We came up with a QSOFA score. It's not a definition, it's a suggested way in one minute at the bedside to identify the at-risk patient. Managing it, well, I'm sure you've probably all seen the uh, latest guidelines, but you'll see here that I think the relative paucity of evidence. So we had 32 strong recommendations of 93 statements, but the strong recommendations were underpinned by moderate evidence in only 20 of the 32 and low level of evidence in 5 of the 32. And where there was a strong recommendation, these things aren't really related to the management of the septic patient per se. They're just general ICU management statements. Don't give renal dopamine, don't allow hyperglycemia, etc. Transfuse when the haemoglobin is above 70. So... Again, we do lack the real hard evidence to underpin our belief. So, very last few slides. What I do, very simply, if there's an infection, think, is that patient bad or are they at risk of going bad? And clearly, if the patient's bad when I see them, could they have infection? So, you could turn it around the other way. You're often called to see a patient in the emergency department, the ward, who is bad, and then you've got to think, could they be infected? Do I need to treat them for infection? If they're infected but they're not bad, they may not need an antibiotic. It doesn't mean oh, they've got a temperature, I need to give them an antibiotic. Otherwise, if we carry on with that philosophy, we won't have anything left to treat, because every bug will be resistant. Clearly, if they've got a line that might be infected, remove it. And in these patients, watch them closely. If they do deteriorate, treat. And if they are bad, you know, get advice as to best treatment. Source control is very important. You know, try and find the bug. If you can identify the bug, you can give better treatment and a more appropriate antibiotic. I argued a couple of days ago, I'll happily uh, give my talk to anyone who wants it, but this each hour counts, I think, is rather weak. I think you've got to certainly not delay. I think you've got a longer window than one hour. But I think, therefore, think about it, treat it, get advice. And source control. That's crucial. I think source control is probably the key thing you can do. So resuscitate the patient. If they're ill, you need to jump on them like any sick patient. Give them oxygen. Don't drown them with oxygen, but don't under-treat them. <coughs> Likewise with fluid. There's no magic formula. Don't drown them, don't give them too little. So you've got to use the tools at your disposal to try and get it right. And obviously ventilatory support. If their blood pressure is too low, what does too low mean? Well, it means that that pressure isn't adequate enough to support perfusion. So there's evidence, you believe, of hypoperfusion related to a low blood pressure. So you don't have to treat everyone just because they've got a low blood pressure they may be perfectly all right with a low blood pressure. And clearly, if you're measuring the cardiac output, which I do, I believe in, then you can use something with a more inotropic action rather than the vasopressor action. And there are lots of clever things, quirky things you can do. Oops, sorry, I've gone down there. So, again, there's some evidence base to support these things. Again, we all have our beliefs, our religion, um, these things come into my religion for certain defined types of septic patients. I can't put my hand in my heart and say, yep, definitive proof, but I think these are the things we need to think about on top of basic <laughs> practice. I'll finish there. This is my final slide. This is what we don't want. You know, I think, unfortunately, we're dumbing down medical practice in general. Follow the algorithm, follow the algorithm, do not pass go. We need to retain the ability to think, to deviate, if we can justify why. So the, the guidelines are there to guide us, but they shouldn't dictate, you have to do it this way and no other way. Use your brain, and clearly, you know, we need to look around and see the light and uh, not hide from it. On that note, I'll finish, and thank you very much for listening.